Well, good morning and welcome once again to Virtual Church. Great to have you with us. It's Saturday the 20th of March. Tomorrow is going to be the equinox. So the sure sign that winter is past and spring is here. That the days and the nights are now of equal length. And a poignant time to be talking about today's I Am Saying from John's Gospel. Because today we're looking at I Am the Resurrection and the Life from John chapter 11. This is a difficult saying for me in lots of ways because the time I say it most frequently, frequently is at funeral services. I've had a lot of those recently, three last week. A couple more to come next week. Today we heard the news of the loss of a friend of ours, Karin, a Finnish friend that we used to know in London back in the 1970s. And um, it's got all these heavy associations which can make us miss the joy of this saying. I am the resurrection. I am the life. Because of all those funerals, I associate it with death. But Jesus is talking about life. It's another one of his life sayings here. The bread of life. And the um, all, all those others that talk about life. The one who's come to bring, uh, the gate of the sheep who's come to bring life in all its fullness. And we'll see some more life sayings as we go through. Well, we haven't time to read out the whole story, it's quite long, but of course this is connected with the death and the raising of Jesus' friend Lazarus. We've mentioned before that John's Gospel appears to be structured around a series of signs. So uh, the feeding of the 5,000 is treated as a sign. The opening of the eyes of a man born blind is treated as, as a sign. And what do they point to, these signs? They point to who Jesus is. So the feeding of the 5,000 is linked to Jesus saying, I am the bread of life. The opening of the eyes of the man born blind is linked to, I am the light of the world. And in the same way, uh, this saying, I am the resurrection and the life, is linked to the story of the raising of Lazarus. It begins uh, at some distance away when Jesus gets news that Lazarus isn't well. And his disciples have been debating whether or not to go back to Judea because they've been threatened. They've been told they're not welcome and uh, they feel their lives are in danger, but Jesus has already decided he's going to go anyway. But although he gets the news that Lazarus is sick, He's not going quite yet. And sometimes that happens with us. It's not God's time for us to do something. Or it is God's time to take Lazarus. Jesus knew what his plans were. But although he heard how ill Lazarus was, and contrary to his usual practice, because almost always when he's asked something, he goes straight away. That's what happened with Jairus' daughter. He just stopped what he was doing, refocused, straight off to do it. Uh, but not this time. He waited a couple more days. In fact, if you work out the, the maths of the story, uh, when Jesus gets there after a two-day journey, Lazarus has already been dead a couple of days, so he'd actually already died by the time Jesus got the news that he was ill. And that's why he says Lazarus has already died to his disciples. But he waits. It's not the time. And sometimes it is our time. Maybe this was Lazarus's time. In all these things, which are beyond our control, we are so deeply in God's hands, aren't we? When he gets there, then, it's... Uh, turns out that Lazarus is the brother, the little brother, because the head of the household appears to be perhaps bossy Martha, or maybe some of the time spiritual Mary. And this is the first time Lazarus has really had a good look in. So I think he's very much their younger brother uh, in this household. 
Lots of people have come out to comfort them. And that's always what happens when a young person dies. I recently had to take the service for someone who's only 48. And our hearts are really wrenched in that situation, aren't we? As we feel that that person never really had time to pass on their wisdom to their children or to use all their gifts to the full. We feel, uh, as we do with every death, but more so in the young, what a tragic waste. Martha's just about holding it together. She manages at least to find the strength to go out and see Jesus, and she reproaches him. And we do reproach God at these times. Let's be honest. But in the face of death, we do. When we lose someone that we care about, we do. Lord, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Where were you when I needed you? Why didn't you come when I sent for you? And that's when Jesus says these words of hope. Amen. Um, your brother will rise again, he says. Martha says, well, I know he rises in the resurrection at the last day. What about now? And Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who was to come into the world. And the amazing thing about Martha here is she is she seeing what the sign is pointing to, who Jesus is, before the sign has even happened. Sometimes we think, well, Martha's the busy one, distracted with much serving. Does she really sort of get what's what Jesus is all about? She really does here, doesn't she? And Jesus moves on, and now uh, he uh, now Mary comes, Martha. Uh, calls her, says, Jesus is asking for you, and finally Mary comes. And um, the crowd follow, and she falls at Jesus' feet and utters the same reproach. I trusted you. Lord, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. I trusted you. You didn't come. Where were you when I needed you? And this is where we come to the shortest and perhaps most profound verse in the Bible. Only two words, but, um, and it is, Jesus wept. Now, why did Jesus weep? I've heard all sorts of sermons about this, which I think are just plain wrong. I've heard people say that Jesus wasn't really weeping for Lazarus or for Martha or for Mary because he knew he was going to raise Lazarus and make everything all right. Uh, so was he really weeping because he himself was going to die and be buried? And uh, maybe he was weeping for himself. I don't think Jesus was full of self-pity uh, in that kind of way. I, certainly I think Jesus uh, was looking at his own death because it was only days away at this point uh, in John's Gospel. But he's surely looking at what's happened to Lazarus and how it's uh, what death has destroyed Mary uh, and, and just left her in pieces, traumatized her. Um, and what ha it's done to the love between Martha and Mary and Lazarus because death severs our relationship. Jesus weeps because death is our enemy. It's our oppressor. It's hateful. It's horrible. It's alien. It wasn't God's purpose for the world that death should come. It was sin that brought death into the world by alienating us from God. And it's because he's confronting the bitter foe of the human race that Jesus is weeping here. Suppose Jesus had been able to look at death unmoved, as some of the preachers I've been talking about seem to think. He just um, 
not had his heart touched in the presence of death. Well, we would know by that that he doesn't get our suffering, that he doesn't understand our pain, that he doesn't get what loss is, that he can't be there for us in our grief and our bewilderment. That's what we would understand if Jesus hadn't wept. And we'd have thought he'd gone to the cross as somebody invincible anyway, whom death could not touch. So has he even really been there on the cross for us? If he hadn't been moved, if he hadn't wept here for us, Jesus weeps because of the cruel separation that death brings. He weeps because death is the enemy of love and cuts us off from one another. And uh, then he goes to the tomb uh, and tells them to roll away the stone. This is typical Jesus, uh, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> roll away the stone. I'm, as a vicar, I'd be really concerned if if Jesus came to one of my funerals. I hope he's actually in all my funerals. I believe he's in all my funerals. But he couldn't let them alone, could he? He's in the very act of t carrying the coffin out to be buried. He comes up to the widow of Nain and, and raises the son for whom she's weeping in devastation uh, from the dead. He just couldn't leave those things alone because death was his enemy. And he's, he's squaring up to it. In the same way, in the, uh, at the death of Jairus' daughter, he throws out all the professional mourners and the flute players, uh, tells them to get lost because he's come to do something about it and uh, take away the stone. But Lord, and how many but Lords do we get in our own lives when Jesus tells us to do something or to see somebody? But, Lord, we think we know better, don't we? He's been in there four days. And Jesus tells Martha to just believe what authority he has. It takes a lot of front to bust up a funeral service. They take away the stone. Jesus prays. He thanks the Father that he's been heard. And then he says, Lazarus comes out. And out he comes. Well, what an amazing sign that one day we shall rise. Jesus didn't go round to every grave that there was in Israel at that time and raise them all. He came specifically because of Lazarus, maybe partly because he was a young man, maybe because of the, the love that was between them and between the sisters. Um, but he comes because there is a sign that comes shortly before Jesus himself is going to die and rise. And the sign is of that bigger theme that applies to us all. I remember looking back on the Stanley Spencer series. I don't know if you watched those virtual churches the hen at the end uh, the, that we did as the last one, we said, look at the, those egg shapes. It's the, the ground bubbling up. It's just like the bubbling up of the ground in Spencer's paintings of the resurrection. He shows a resurrection of soldiers killed in the First World War. Uh, in, and, and he also shows Cookham Churchyard bubbling over with life. Jesus comes bringing the resurrection. And if it doesn't come right here and now for this person, if it doesn't mean that we ourselves are not going to go through the horrible process of extinction, uh, well, it does mean that Jesus himself is the resurrection and the life. And that by knowing him, we already have hold of our resurrection life. If we have him, we have resurrection already at work inside us. And this is one of the things about the I Am sayings. Jesus never says, I give 
the bread of life. He doesn't say, I'll bring you the light of the world. He doesn't say, I'll, I'll get you through somehow to resurrection. He says, I am the bread. I am the light. I am the resurrection. That's what God does. He doesn't give us Jesus and add things on with lots of add-ons. He gives us Jesus, and it's in Jesus that we find our bread. It's Jesus who is our light, and it's Jesus who is our resurrection. His presence living inside us by the Holy Spirit is our guarantee that we are in Christ, and therefore we will participate in the resurrection from the dead. The resurrection is Jesus. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. We already have him in our hearts. That more abundant life is not least the life of Jesus living in us. Jesus is the new humanity, the redeemed humanity come amongst us. And if we are in Christ, then we participate in the things that are of Christ, both in his cross, his death to all our sin, and in his life, and in his resurrection. So if we already have this resurrection life at work in us, isn't it wonderful? What a thought and what courage uh, to face what is inevitable, the journey we're all on, the necessary journey. Because if we never died out of this life, then life would never pass on to the next generation and they would never get their turn to live their way because the elders, hundreds or thousands of years old, would still be there. We have to have change and development and growth in the world that's a necessary part of that. But we move on to the new world, the world made new in Christ, and we're all already participants, because the new Adam, the new human being, is already in us, in Christ. Uh, that phrase, in Christ, that's at the uh, very heart of so many of the New Testament letters. One thing I do want to say, just to finish with, is I'm often asked at funerals to read that poem that begins that death is nothing at all. And I hate it. I'm sorry if you've chosen it or had it at the funeral of someone you care about, and I know why you want to hear what it's got to say. Death made Jesus weep. It goes a little bit further because it says, just before Jesus wept, that he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. And these Greek words are extremely powerful. Uh, they're, 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 they're words of... <sighs> they, they, they evoke a, a sort of being overwhelmed and, and almost panting to try and stay a, a hold. Uh, of life. That's what they did to Jesus. That's what death did to him. Scripture says the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Death isn't nothing at all. Death is a bitter foe, an enemy of the human race. It did that to Jesus. And we can't pretend. There's a whole psychological thing of denial going on if we try and pretend that death is nothing, is nothing at all. It is an enemy. It is a bitter fight, but it is one that we will win through Jesus Christ because he's won the victory for us. And we will then find that death is still nothing at all. It's a door to be nearer to God than we ever can be in this life. Thanks be to our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who delivers us from this body of death. Let us pray.
Dear Lord, sometimes our lot in life seems so hard and bitter. With everything we think we've achieved, every person that we've loved, every place we've ever inhabited, we are going sooner or later to have to let go of. But thank you, Lord, that you will never let go of us, that even in death you will hold on to us. Praise you that you are the resurrection in your very self and the life, and that you have brought this life to us who trust in you. We bring before you, Lord, our awe and wonder at this great mystery and at you. And we commend ourselves afresh to your tender keeping, thinking especially of those amongst us who are bereaved. Give them your peace, we pray. In Jesus' name, Amen. Just one last thing to say. I see I've been slightly longer about this one uh, than usual. Uh, so, uh, Sunday tomorrow, the churches are both open these days. But although we're careful about keeping numbers down, you do have to book to come to St Andrews. Um, St Michael's Holy Communion service and in St Andrew's it's our new life service and looking forward to hearing what Tony and Heather have to share. So until then God bless you and the Lord be your shelter and your strong tower. Amen. <laughs>